Welcome everybody to Teal Talks, where we have bold, intelligent conversations with innovators, leaders, and influencers from around the world. My name is Mariana Tiebet, and I'm the AVP of Health Equity at Merck, also known as MSD outside the USA and Canada. Today, we are talking about health equity, what it is, how we work towards it, and what it means to achieve it. I'm thrilled to introduce our two esteemed guests, champions, catalysts, and fierce protectors of health equity, Dr. Marcella Nunes-Smith and Dr. Aletha Maybank. Since 2019, Dr. Aletha Maybank has served as the Chief Health Equity Officer and Senior Vice President for the American Medical Association. Dr. Nunes-Smith is a CNH Long Professor of Internal Medicine, Public Health, and Management at Yale University. I am honored to have you both here. So let's get to it. You, as we have all heard, are champions of health equity. I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Nunes-Smith. Uh, what does health equity mean to you? And what have we learned about it during the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, I often do remind people that COVID-19 did not create any of the inequities that we've seen. Um, but it did absolutely take advantage of them. And I think over these past couple of years, we've had this collective witnessing. Um, and I think importantly, perhaps we have a moment to reset where terms like health equity are becoming just part of the common lexicon. For me, it's about making sure that we have the structures in place that will allow everyone to achieve their optimal health and well being. Right. And I really emphasize and lean into structures because it's structures and problems with structures and intentionality around structures that have gotten us to where we are today. And by that, I mean, there have been intentional policy decisions here in the United States and dare I say around the world that have systematically disadvantaged particular groups of people. And so we're going to need intentionality around structures, around systems um, to really do that important redress. Um, but it is a positive concept, health equity, right? I think that's what I want people to understand. There is hope, there is optimism in that phrase. So Dr. Maybank, what does health equity mean to you? Um, you know, I, I am in full kind of alignment, you know, with um, what Dr. Nunez-Smith has already expressed as it relates to, um, you know, equity as an outcome being about achieving the opportunity really to achieve optimal health. I usually do, and it's kind of the opportunities, it's the conditions as was mentioned already, you know, with the structures, um, the resources, but also the power. You know, we need to have all of those contexts in order to really achieve optimal health or all of them are important in understanding of achieving optimal health. I will say, you know, you know, as I evolve kind of in this space and doing the work and I'm kind of pushed in many different ways, mm -hmm. I really do like to get though to the human context of this work because oftentimes I feel more and more that my role in this role of what it means to do health equity is a lot about convincing people to care, you know, and to really care in the work that they're doing, how they're doing it, who they're engaging, who are they listening to, how are they listening, um, to really work to the space of transforming our systems and our structures that we know aren't set up to really provide opportunity for all of us to achieve optimal health. Uh, I think many people fear that actually this is just a moment in time. Um, and, you know, we, we may not be able to capitalize, you know, on this moment in time where there is heightened awareness uh, of health equity uh, across our society. H how do we make sure that this is not a moment, uh, but actually a movement, you know, that you both have been talking about? Uh, and I'll start with you, Aletha. Yes, yeah, so, you know, it, there are a couple of reflections on that. Um, to be clear, you know, that we are still part of the movement. I think this work is part of the movement, you know. We, we hear the familiar words of the arc of justice of what MLK would talk about. Mm -hmm. However, you know, just going back to our ancestors, whether indigenous ancestors, you know, who had to struggle and fight for their land as best as they could, ancestors who came from the continent, um, who also, you know, struggle, fought mm -hmm. for generations, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think about people like Ida B. Wells and, you know, the, the work that she did and how, you know, I, counting bodies, that's hard work. You know, we have hard times, no doubt but we aren't there. Um, and so I think about the movement that we are still in this movement, the movement already started, you know, and we're, we're just working to propel it forward. Now we have the opportunity of now, of course, 
in terms of a lot of attention that, that is kind of being put towards inequities and equity because of the exposure of uh, what COVID has provided, but also the public murder of George Floyd, which kind of elevated and pro or propelled this country to really have a greater reckoning around the impacts of racism on many different levels. So we have in this arc, these, this, this marathon of what everybody likes to talk about, but it, we also have these moments and opportunities for sprinting. We have to move quickly. These doors don't open all the time, right? And they close quickly to Marcel, I'm sure can really speak to that. You know, being in the federal administration and what that means, we have a time of where the doors are open right now, where we can talk about equity and we can talk about racism. But how do we set up the time right now to make sure that when the door does close, because oftentimes it will politically, what do we do and how do we move forward? No, I, I, I love that. And it speaks to um, Marcella, you talked about structural change. So would, would love your perspective on, on you know, this journey towards structural transformation. That is something that has kept me up at night, um, for sure, is the, the real hope that the work, you know, for example, as Aletha referenced, the work in the federal administration, you know, here in the United States, we have a president, um, we have a vice president who have been very clear uh, literally on day one of the administration, the president signing numerous executive orders that really recognize the detrimental influence of uh, structural biases and racism um, across everything in our lives, including, including health. Uh, and that's really important, right? But many of those, that's, those are executive orders, right? And so understanding the urgency I think of uh, the need to act has just been highly motivating. Um, I know for me, for many colleagues, and certainly for the work in the administration, to, to be sure that we are uh, laying the necessary foundation for the movement, right? For sustaining all of the changes that we put in place. I think it's just critical to always have that long view. Again, I think you'll see the theme for me today. I am really quite optimistic. Right, I, not not uh, hopefully not in a naive way, but there is something different about the now. Um, I think it is different when we have the collective witnessing of public violence and harm against so many groups <laughs> that we've seen around the globe um, that the technology, quite frankly, has allowed us to see and, and to not deny. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important for us to, to know that we have, I think, a sentiment as a people that really says this is unacceptable, mm -hmm. right? this loss of potential. And I just wanna linger there for a second because I so agree that the narrative is critical. We spend so much time in the statistics and they are really, really sobering. Um, but understanding each person, right? Each neighbor that we have lost to COVID-19, that we have lost to unnecessary hate-fueled violence, right, is about lost potential. And that is something that we all suffer from, right, that loss. It's not something happening over there. It's something happening here to each one of us, to each one of our neighborhoods and communities. So I am just really inspired by the young people. And as a parent, I put a lot of faith in the generations that are coming to not let this just be a moment, but to make sure it's a movement. I want to talk a little bit about that cultural transformation. You know, Letha, um, tell us a little bit more about your tenure at the American Medical Association and, you know, what that has meant uh, or uh, about cultural transformation there. You know, a lot of the strategy and, and equity is a strategy, you know, as we said, it's a process, it's a strategy of which people can employ. And I do like to come up, like quote Kamara Jones, because I think this is really important in terms of, you know, the strategy of equity is one valuing all people equally and really our data is telling us that we don't you know i get and, and our, our data are representations of our structures and what um, is structurally inequitable and so valuing all people equally cherishing all people equally is critical one that's one two understanding the historical context how we got here as individuals as institutions and as a collective as a country is really critical also to understand and how to kind of move our equity strategy forward and then the last part is about redistribution of resources um, to those who are most in need. I bring that up because in the context of doing equity work, oftentimes people really transition to the technical aspects of doing organizational change work, which is really important. You know, focusing on things like workforce equity, 
um, pay equity, um, how we communicate, is that equitable? All of those are really critical. They're technical pieces, but we have to focus on what you're asking me about, the cultural. How are we trans transforming culture? How people show up, how people like really belong, um, how we're challenging our mental models every single day of what, how we typically look in, at under, and understand situations. Are the spaces we're in, are they psychologically as well as physically safe for us to even have conversations around power and privilege and race? That's, that's where the cultural transformation pieces really begin. Uh love for you both you know to talk about the role of partnerships in that uh, uh, in terms of bringing different perspectives uh, different solutions different experiences different expertise uh, you know to the issue thank you um, for the question you know i i'm i'm not um, I'm not yet embracing the term like sort of the silver lining of the pandemic um, be, because you know the grief is is real um, but I will say something that I'm particularly excited about uh, that I saw emerge during the pandemic and I hope last is the breaking down of many silos right in a quick quick fashion um, towards sort of common goal uh, and common purpose. And really, I think manifesting the power of partnership. Let me just give a couple quick examples and I'll probably just use as frame of reference uh, working with the federal administration around COVID-19 and COVID-19 equity in particular. You know, we've talked about these structural drivers of health in our conversation already today, the importance of things like food, right? And having nutritious food, housing, having really quality housing that is stable, right? Economic opportunity, educational opportunity, economic stability, right? All of these things that we know contribute to, to health equity. And even as we took as a microcosm of uh, working on vaccination, how one has access to the vaccine itself, to the information that's accurate and necessary, we identified, we heard from our constituents, lesson one in partnership, right? making sure that we're elevating the expertise of those with the lived experience, the situational wisdom, um, showing up, as Alita said, in a way that humbles ourselves before that expertise and says we're here to listen and then to act, right? And we heard from so many important stakeholders and constituents that people were having difficulty accessing vaccination because of those same structural drivers, right? not being able to have access to transportation, for example, childcare, another. And we saw private partners, right? This is industry. And so I often, I fight back a lot when industry, um, uh, you know, I don't think there's a, there should be a reflex that in industry and somehow is not on this walk as well, or can't be, right? Because we've seen that in the moment, important private Industry partners stepped up and said, so we're going to provide transportation, right, um, at the president's request. And I think we need to be celebrating and elevating those who take that social responsibility seriously and are modeling for others. So my last question, what, what's your call to action, you know, for our listeners around going out and finding, uh, you know, the, the work, the, the, the achievements we have to make uh, around health equity? I try to be attuned to the way that I'm reacting, right? In whatever the situation is and calling myself out when it's important, right? Why did I think that? Why did I do that? And so having that kind of attention just to the way that we are showing up spaces is going to be difference making and something we can all do in the fight for justice. And the second is to recognize your power, right? In the face of something this big, it can be perhaps even easy to say I am powerless to change it. But we all have power, each one of us. We sit at tables where decisions are being made. Let us make sure that we own that responsibility. As we sit at that table, we recognize who is not there. We call for that expertise to be present, but we also, also make sure that we can be that voice for who has been marginalized, who has been minoritized, who has been underserved, and how is this policy and this decision going to land on those people, on those communities? And let us just have a moment to reflect on that. Even just calling for that in your day-to-day -day meetings and work will be transformative. And I just thank you in advance for all the good work I know everybody's going to do. 
Alitha, your call to action for us? But there's always a context within our community, like our physical spaces in terms of the neighborhoods of which we live, the cities in which we live, the counties which, which, which we live, um, you know, the rural spaces of which we live, that we could get more proximate to one another, so closer, um, and, and hear and experience what each other's actually going through to actually move our spirits. Because I'm a believer that, you know, and this, this plays out in politics, that we're really not moved by numbers. Numbers are important. They help us um, understand a situation and a problem. They help us with accountability. But in terms of really driving a soul and a spirit to do differently, to think differently and be differently, that comes from movement and touching the heart. And you, that happens when we hear each other's stories and we're able to identify and connect with one another's kind of humanity in a very shared way. So I just, I recommend to get proximate to people who you usually don't get proximate to. Thank you so much. And, and thank you to the both of you. Uh, you know, I have been so honored, privileged, and inspired, uh, energized, invigorated, uh, you know, to be part of this conversation. Uh, thank you for your work. <laughs>